it's time to start talking about how to manage large amounts of data. We've actually uh, seen enough that if we have the ability to work with lots of data, there is a huge amount that we can do. There's only one major thing we have left in the course besides dealing with large amounts of data and keeping it organized, which is how do we get large amounts of data from outside the program, not just from the user, but from a file or from somewhere else. But first we have to talk about how do we manage an amount of data that is too great just to store inside of variables. And we're actually gonna spend, I, I think most of the rest of the course, except for one topic on the side, we're gonna be talking about variants of this problem as our big source of motivation. So first, um, this task is read three integers from the user, then print them back out in reverse order. And as of uh, last week's labs, or this week's labs, the lab you just did, as of the lab you just did, we actually have everything we need to do this because we can now read numbers from the user using scanf. So the labs talked about scanf, we've seen scanf pop up here and there. Scanf is thought of as being the inverse of the printf function. So printf is designed to print out uh, text to the user and then we use these substitutions to print out the values of variables. Scanf is designed to read data from the user using the same type of substitution, for the most part, um, to tell it what kind of value to read. Do you want an int? Do you want a float? Um, you might have noticed in the labs one key difference, one way in which scanf isn't a mere image of printf, is that uh, when we pass in something to scanf, we pass a pointer, which is one reason we couldn't talk about scanf until now, until we know about pointers. Okay, so all we're saying here is read three values from the user, we'll put them in these variables v1, v2, v3, and then print them out in reverse order. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I want to use scanf for this. I'm going to use a... Um, a variable to keep track of how many values were actually read. So if we ask scanf to read input, there's a possibility that the user doesn't enter input that scanf can work with. And we have to have a way of figuring that out. Um, and to demonstrate that point, I'm going to try calling scanf with no other information. So I'm going to tell scanf to read three integers. And uh, I'll read the first one into v1, the second one, whoops, the second one into v2, and the third one into v3. Okay, so first thing, if you ever have to use scanf, um, check after, or immediately, check right after writing it that um, you've put an ampersand on the arguments. It's a really easy thing to forget. I forget it all the time. Uh, and the compiler will often be nice to you and tell you about it. Let's see what happens if, so if I compile this, um, okay, unused variable, fair enough. But suppose I forget an ampersand here. I forget to pass in a pointer. Uh, the compiler is actually being nice here and it does catch that. It says, are you sure? Um, because when you use scanf, it expects int star. It expects that you gave it a pointer to an int, not just an int. Because I'm telling scanf to go and grab something from the user User and then put it in this location. So I have to provide it a pointer to somewhere to put something. All right, let's try this. I'm going to run this program and it's broken. There is an aspect of it, the ability to um, detect if the user hasn't entered valid input that we're not yet doing. Um, I guess I'll compile it again though first. All right, so enter three numbers. Okay, I'll enter, um, let's see, well, I, I can't think of, I, I only have three numbers I can ever think of, six, and then 10, and then 17. And it prints them out in reverse. Okay, great, let's try that again. 111, and then I press enter three times, 187, 225. Okay, great. And it still prints them out in reverse. And you might notice when you tell scanf to read multiple numbers, it, they don't necessarily have to be separated the same way they are in the call to scanf. In fact, if you ask scanf to read numbers, scanf is designed for formatted input, which skips over white space. And so if I ask for three numbers, it will skip over whatever white space it needs to between the numbers uh, until it reads the next one. But what if I do this? So I, I start entering input. Okay, so 111 six, and then I just get bored and I enter some garbage. I press enter and you can see scanf was able to read that 111. It then said, oh, there's a space, I'll skip over that. Then it read a six and said, okay, good, there's another space, I'll skip over that. And then it saw some text and it stopped. And what happened was if you ask scanf to read you three ints, it'll read ints and it'll skip over spaces. But if it hits anything else, it'll stop. It doesn't know what to do. And so it just stops on the A character and doesn't continue. 
And I've asked it to read three ints, and it did read two of the three, but it didn't read all of them. So how do I figure this out? Obviously, I'm supposed to print an error message if the user um, doesn't enter three numbers. And in this case, it just continued as normal. And you might notice the value of V3 at the end was just the original value of V3. Scanf didn't touch it at all. Now, I, I suppose I could use the value of V3 as a sentinel. I could notice at the end, hey, V3 is still equal to 3,000. Maybe the user didn't enter anything. But what if the user actually entered 3,000? And maybe you can convince yourself that there is no way for the value in the variable to tell us whether or not the user entered an invalid thing, because the user could always have entered the number 3,000 legitimately as their third input. So we need some other way of having Scanf tell us whether it could succeed. And it, it has that way. It actually has a return value. The return value of Scanf is the number of things that it read in total. So here I've asked it to read me three things. And that means if Scanf is successful, it'll return the number three here. And so what I should do is then test. If the number of values read is not equal to three, then we're in trouble. Then Scanf couldn't read all three values. And it says right here, if for some reason we can't read all three values, print out an error message. Okay, so I'll print an error message, error, um, fewer than three values read. Okay, and then what do I do? Well, if there is an error, I guess the program is now over. So I shouldn't go down and try and print out the values. I should end the program. I should return from main to indicate that I can't do anything. The user should try again, so I'll return. This is a rare case where a return zero is probably fine here, but maybe you would want to use a return one. We already know that um, main's return value is supposed to be some kind of exit code that tells the operating system if the program was successful. Zero if it was, something else if it wasn't. So strangely, confusingly, the opposite of the usual true and false in C. So maybe we'll return one here, although really that's trivia. In this course, we very rarely care about that. But that might be one of the rare instances where returning something other than zero from main would be warranted. All right, so I enter 6 and 10 and 17, and that still works. But here I enter 6 and then 10 and then some junk, and here it gives that error message. It says, fewer than three values read. Scanf wasn't able to read everything you asked it for. So here I've put three uh, uh, format specifiers in the Scanf call, and so Scanf will return 0, 1, 2, or 3. Um, another option I could use here is instead of just reading all three values in a single call to Scanf, I could also read the three values separately. So I could say, okay, let's start by reading the first value. I'm just gonna read one thing, read that into V1. And if that equals, if that is not equal to one, so here Scanf has only asked for one thing, so logically I should only see a return value of zero or one. If the number of values read is not equal to one, print out, I couldn't read the first value. And then just like before, we'll return one. And so what I could do is I could read each of my three values independently with three consecutive calls to Scanf, because each call to Scanf will just um, eat up as much of the input as needed to do the thing that was asked. So if I enter three numbers and ask Scanf to read one of them, it'll read the six, and then it'll stop right there. And so uh, when I call Scanf again, it'll pick it up and then read the 10 and so on. Um, and so at each step, I, I, it's up to me whether I want to call Scanf over and over again or whether I want to call Scanf in one pass. And we'll actually see later that it turns out that calling Scanf repeatedly to read one number can actually be more flexible in a lot of cases. Okay, so we'll test this out, this version where I call Scanf individually. And we notice in this case it's sort of nice because I can now tell which value I didn't read successfully. We can stop at each point. Um, Whoops, so we'll recompile. We'll try this, 6, 10, 17. Okay, that still works. And here I enter 1, and then I get tired. And it says, couldn't read the second value. It read the first value successfully, but then it stopped at the second one. So there's two ways of doing it. It's, as usual, sort of a matter of personal taste. I think for this example, it's just fine to... Um, read them all in one pass with a single call to Scanf. And then I uh, print those numbers out in reverse. So the key thing about printing them in reverse is that if I were just printing them in the same order, so you enter three numbers and then I print them out one at a time, maybe you could argue that I don't need to keep them all together. I could just read one, then print it out. Read another one, then print it out. Read the third one, then print it out. But if I'm printing them in reverse, I need to have the last number already read before I print anything. So I need to store all three of those numbers. That's significant. We need that to motivate our next topic. But I want to do one more thing. I want to add one extension to this. 
So I print out the values in reverse, and then I've got this sequence of if statements. So here I ask the user, okay, you've entered three values. Which one do you want me to print out for you today? So I'm gonna actually make the program more interactive with this uh, extension. Okay, enter three numbers, six, 10, 17. It prints them out in reverse. Which value do you want? Okay, print out num the value number three. That was the value 17. So you can see what I have to do here is use this stack of if statements. If the user entered one, print out v1. If the user entered two, print out v2. If the user entered three, print out v3. And that seems a bit expensive. If there were more values, I'd have a really unpleasant set of if statements here. So we've seen scanf great, you saw scanf in the labs. That wasn't actually the point of this video. The point of this video is how much more complicated could this example get before what we know isn't enough? So here, read three numbers from the, for the user, uh, print them out in reverse. We can do that. We have everything we need. We don't need to learn anything new. If I asked you, could you change this to work with 10 numbers instead of three? You could say, sure, it's going to be a bit of a slog, v3, v4, v5, v6, v7, v8, v9, v10. I need 10 different variables, but you could do that, 10 values, sure. If I said, could you read 100 values? Okay, we're pushing it, but you could make 100 variables. What about 1,000? What about 10,000 values? The computer can easily store 10,000 things. Do you want to write code with v1, v2, v3, up to v9,000, v9,001, v9,002, up to v9,999, v10,000? Of course you don't. I should be able to read as much data as I might need. If you tell me in advance I'm going to need a million things, I should be able to read that. But I don't want to make a million variables. And even worse, I don't want to deal with a stack of a million if statements. Here, the problem with this is the user enters that they want v1 or v2 or v3. But there's no way to tell the language that v1, v2, v3 are sort of connected to each other. They're supposed to be three pieces of related data. Instead, if I want to pick out which thing the user chose, I have to ask about each one separately. That means that the cost goes up exponentially as I add more values to the mix. And that's no good. What I need is the ability to store a whole bunch of data without having to declare each value independently. So I don't want to have to write v1, v2, v3. I want to be able to ask for three values in a row or 10 values in a row without having to have them be independent variables. And I would like to be able to interact with that data like it's related. If somebody asks for number one, number two, or number three, I shouldn't need three if statements. So what I need, I think I've proven the point that although what we have now is sufficient to read three values, if I want to read a whole bunch of values, let's say a thousand of them, I need some more convenient way of keeping my data. And that's going to be our next topic. That's arrays. Now after that, we might begin asking questions like, hey, what if we don't know in advance how many numbers the user wants to enter? What if instead we ask the user, how many values will you be entering today? And they enter 5,000, and then we read that number. That's the next topic after that. And then one of the topics we want to get to at the very end of the course is, what if we don't know at all how many values the user wants to enter? What if they just keep entering values until they're done? And we have to store all of them as we go. Um, that's a tougher problem. We need to know quite a few other things before then. So we're going to start by talking about how do we deal with lots of data at a time in a convenient way. And that is a topic called arrays.